And you would be surprised, uh, all of our listeners, that there are great salespeople you know who will self-identify as as shy, but you'll never know it because they are the best at connecting and communicating. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Byron, host of the Sales and Podcast, and welcome to today's show. On today's show, we have Suzanne Ruan, who is a conversation and networking expert, and that's exactly what we're talking about today. We're talking about how to walk into a room and sell the place, how to engage in conversations, how to lead conversations into a, a conversation essentially about sales, which is why we're there in the first place, whether we should do that in the first instance, whether we should get contact details first, all that stuff, and it's essentially a step-by-step guide, so I hope you get a lot out of this one. You can find out more about Suzanne over at SuzanneRowan.com, and with that all said, let's jump in to today's episode. Hey, Susan, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Oh, it's great to be back. Thank you so much. I'm glad to have you back on, and today we're going to dive into working a room, and I've got some more like strategic questions that we'll come to at the end of the show, but I want to start off with a super obvious question that you've been asked a million times over, but this will tee up the next few that are coming at you, Susan. And that is, are salespeople specifically who are great at walking into a room, building relationships, building warmth, building rapport and having conversations with people, are those individuals naturally good at it? Is it a natural gift or is it something that they've learned over time? I think it depends on the person. You know, some people think that all salespeople are great at it, but I know a number of salespeople who readily admit they're shy, but they say, hey, this is my job. So it's because my job, I want to get better at it. And this is so interesting. It will be salespeople that will buy my book because they know how important walking into a room, meeting people, building relationships, if not a direct client or referral and they want to get better. It's the people that really need to know how to work room that they don't know that that's something they should do. So I think salespeople know it. I don't think everyone is natural at it, but because it's a job that they know that this is part of it, that they work very hard. And you would be surprised, uh, all of our listeners, that there are great salespeople you know who will self-identify as as shy, but you'll never know it because they are the best at connecting and communicating. But they're they're actually better than the um, accountants as a group, the engineers of the um, actuaries. So you mentioned something here, which I don't want to gloss over, and it's super important, and this will tee up every other conversation I'm going to have here on the Salesman Podcast, and that is that you aligned getting better at skills such as these, which are perhaps softer skills as opposed to, um, you know, learning how to use software to sell or anything like that. You align that with, you've got to get better at it because it's your job. How important is it for salespeople to make that alignment between these two things? Because there's a lot of people out there that you you, you painted a, a nice pleasant picture of the sales industry, but I would say there's a decent percentage of people that go, I don't like, um, networking and you know socializing and and building up conversations out of the blue and so I'm just not going to do it how how much is how important is it for them to treat it like the job and to get these skills nailed I would say so important and and you know you mentioned something that I is a pet peeve I am so tired of hearing people say oh I hate networking well get over it And now let me just define working a room is socializing. You go to parties, you go to cousins, weddings, you go to fundraisers, you go to neighborhood picnics. Socializing is so much a part of our lives that if you can do that in business, and by the way, when you're at a wedding, you might meet a potential client. When you're, you might, I know this is going to sound awful, but you might meet someone at a, not during the funeral while they're putting the coffin in the <laughs> grave. That would be, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the wrong groom to work. But afterwards, at the, ooh, whether you call it the, um, it's not the necessarily the wake, but the memorial, lunch, or whatever, afterwards, you get to talk to people. 
and you'd share stories about the person that departed. You might find out someone grew up in a town that you have a cousin in. You, here's what I want to say to all salespeople. This is your mantra from my grandmother to yours. You never know. So you never know who you're going to meet, who you're going to talk to. But I can tell you this. The best salespeople that I know, my father owned a paper company and I knew who his best salesmen were. They didn't have saleswomen back in the day. Big mistake. Were the people who talked to other people, not just sell them things, but had conversations. So if you're not good at it, this is the time to do that. Think of this. If your career is in sales, you you are obligated to be a lifelong learner and to stay as much on top of it as possible. Would you want your accountant to not get the latest? <laughs> I mean, really? Oh, no, I'm going to go to the, the uh, dentist who hasn't taken a course in 30 years. No, 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 no. You want to have relationships. You want to refine your skills. But the most important thing and the ultimate thing is you want relationships. Because let's just say uh, your spouse gets a job in another city and the company you work with doesn't, can't really use your services. If you have relationships and a network in place, you can go to your network and say, hey, we're going to move to Birmingham. That could be England or <laughs> Alabama. I just picked that name. If you know of anyone there, I really would like to meet them. But if you don't socialize, if you don't network, if you don't stay in touch with people, you have nothing to push you forward in your career as a salesperson and in your own network that supports you in your career. So enough of my proselytizing. But to me, even if you're in inside sales, you better have a positive attitude about being in public face to face. I think networking, um, socializing, having this contact uh, kind of database to lean back on. I honestly feel it, even if it doesn't lead to direct sales right at that moment in time, it's so seamless. And so, you know, once you are um, around the right people and you're doing the right things, it's so easy and natural to achieve that it's almost a no brainer because further down the line, it always helps out. Clearly, I'm building a network doing the salesman podcast that I wouldn't have access to perhaps people like yourself otherwise. And so perhaps, you, perhaps people need to look at an excuse to get in front of more people. But I think just the very fundamentals of having that network uh, makes things far easier when you're looking five, 10 years down the line. And with that, Susan, coming back to the, the being in the room with, uh, you know, whether it's you are having a meeting and there's a bunch of C-suite in there, or you've gone to an industry conference and there's a bunch of potential customers there. How much of meeting people and building these relationships, building that initial rapport is down to a skill set versus how much of it is down to just being confident enough to go and talk to people? It's a combination. I mean, you know, you do have to have confidence. You do have to have courage. And as we say, you have to have a little chutzpah, which is like being bold. But if you don't do it, why bother to show up? I mean, this, I once had a, a fellow in one of the programs I gave who, <laughs> I'll never forget this. He raised his hand and he said, you know, I, I believe in not doing to people that which I don't like to do. So I don't like to go over to them because I really don't like when people I don't know come over to me. Will, I had to bite my <laughs> tongue from saying, why are you here? I mean, Really, if you don't like people coming over to you, get therapy for good sake. I mean, when I look at my life and who's in it and why they're in it, it's because I've talked to strangers and I want to underscore this for our listeners. You may have the list of the people you need to meet at every event and you may have done your homework, but... Someone might not be on your list and they're standing in front of you. And I have heard people tell me this, that people in sales will go right past them over to someone else that looks more see Swedish. Oh, I wonder if that's a country, Swedish. Anyway, and they'll go past them not even knowing who that person is. You never know who you're bypassing. So really, this is going to be the 
I guess, the mantra. A salesperson, the smart, successful sales people are nice to everyone in a room, have a kind, connected word, at least have a smile. But if you are always going right to that person that you think is the influencer, I get really tired of all that I read about hang out with the influencers. Guess what? They don't want to hang out with you. They want to hang out with their own kind. But we all are trying to sidle up to people. And that person you bypassed can be the father of an influencer, the spouse of an influencer, the son of an influencer who can open up that door for you. So I think it makes some sense to have a clear focus for what you want to do. But those who walk into a room with clear-cut goals that they must achieve generally look like it's emblazoned (laughs) on their forehead. We don't want to talk to you. So, yes, you must have the confidence. And then you also have to have some skills. So the confidence comes from this, being prepared. And preparation is a little different according to the Rowan rant. Um, Number one, if you know what you're going to talk about, in case there's a dead silence, you'll feel confident. Read the paper. Read a curated summary. I get something called The Week. I get The Guardian. Um, I get um, The Daily Beast. There are things in every country that's summarized. You can even say, I'd like a little bit about sports, a little bit about politics, a little bit about technology. And yes, we should all know what movies are opening and favorite restaurants and we should all know what's going on weather wise let me tell you something when there is a huge massive storm like we had in the florida area i made sure i got in touch with my colleagues and my clients are you okay and you know it's a little thing it has nothing to do with me selling them a speech that wasn't even on the ding are you okay? Of course, it helps that I come from a long line of worriers. That works for me. But, you know, it's staying in touch. And I want all of our listeners in sales, whether you're managing, whether you're on the, on the floor, whether you're inside sales. This is from my second book, The Secrets of Savvy Networking. Actually, my favorite. Stay in touch with people when you need nothing from them. We have a lot of people in sales, oh, I sent them this and I want this. Oh, really? They don't care. Another question I'm often asked. Let me me jump in here because you said something I don't want to gloss over it. And I think you just described it there. So there'll be people listening to this now that go, okay, it's all well and good to say that, you know, just go and talk to people and just do a bit of preparation. But they're still getting that weird feeling in their gut that they don't like to be approached. Now, is this because this is a, a like a learned pattern of behavior because they've had people who are poor at selling come up to them at these events and try and sell them and take, take, take. And so they assume that's what the whole experience is like and they assume that everyone is like that. And so that's why they get that weird feeling perhaps. Well, that's one of the reasons. But the other reason is it's very hard. You know, 90% of us self-identify as shy. So it's very hard to be in a room standing by yourself. It just feels uncomfortable. So I would turn it around. I I think what you said is only part of it. The other part is we'd like to go over to people, but there are several roadblocks. One is that we're taught not to talk to strangers. Another one is we'd love to be introduced, and that gives us entree. Another one is we don't want to be rejected. So if we don't talk to people, that means no one can reject us. But I know that when people in sales come up and they just go right into their spiel, <laughs> it's, it's abhorrent. Um, and that's why conversation, connected conversation that might start with Oh, you're from Ireland. I've always wanted to go to Ireland. Oh, you were in Chicago. Did you get to go to the Art Institute? Little thing. That's why it bonds us. And when you have a common connection that builds conversation, that helps build the confidence. And it builds the relationship. Uh, When I was writing What Do I Say Next, I interviewed a gentleman who 
um, had a he had a, a CD store back in the days. We listened to CDs. I went in for one so I could listen to good music when I was writing, and I came out with five. And I went, ooh, I think he's good at sales. So I asked him, I said, well, you tell me I'm writing my conversation book. Now he's a VP at a company, a VP of sales. I said, Chris, how much a part of sales is conversation? And this is what I want the audience to hear and remember. He said to me, oh, Susan, conversation isn't part of sales. It's the heart of sales. So when you're talking to people, and I'd like to remind you when you're in any room and you're in a conversation with someone, don't play the latest tune in your head. Don't plan your grocery list. If you want to remember people and be remembered by them, focus your attention on the person you're with. That way you'll remember what they said so you can follow up. And the next time you see them, you can pick it up. But if you're busy planning what to say next and when is it my time and how am I going to sell them, you're going to miss the whole opportunity of connection. Is this, so I just gave is this a, idea. Susan, is this a, a, a phenomenon that you see more and more and more, perhaps with the millennial generation as well, of them not being present in the moment when they're having a conversation? You know, I'm not blaming anyone. There's so many more distractions now than there was probably, you know, 20 years ago with your phone constantly going off in your pocket and and everything. Your your watch now beeping at you and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, is this no, maybe I'm true. maybe I'm um, maybe I'm pointing it into context of generations when it doesn't need to be because of course any generation can have an, the latest iPhone. But is this something that you see more and more often now versus perhaps 20 years ago or 10 years ago? Well, first of all, I think you just said something I don't want to, I want to piggyback on. We are, and I may be guilty of it, we are laying the blame for everything at the millennials. And I think that that is a horrible thing to do. First of all, my generation, the boomers, our parents thought we were out of our minds. <laughs> We thought the Gen X were out of the mind. The Gen X think the millennials are out of the mind. No, it's just we're growing. And I want to tell you, the bad behavior, the link to the phone, whatever, knows no generation. I mean, I see people who are grandparents. They're with their grandchildren and they're on the phone. Hold that kid's hand. He's <laughs> crossing the street. So you know what? I think we have as a – it's globally – we have kind of lost perspective. And I'm not going to say it's the millennials. Yes, they don't have as many face-to-face -face skills, but they know that and they think they're connected. It just, we need to give them the opportunity to improve. You know what I think changes the millennials? When they, when they decide that they're getting married, all of a sudden, we got to plan this party after that, Vlad plan that party. And I think that changes um, as we grow up. That's just what happens. But I will say, I think bad behavior crosses all generations. So if I were to say, if you're in sales and you walk in anywhere wearing a Bluetooth or your <laughs> earbuds, put yourself in the corner. <laughs> That's really terrible. That's number one. The second thing is, put your phone on vibrate. Keep it out of people's faces. You're at a conference. You're at a sales meeting. You're in a C-suite situation. You're you're even at a party. Really? You want to show everyone that you're a jerk? Keep your phone out. Yeah. I, I, yeah and I, mean, I think there's super value in the audience listening to this now. And I've experienced this and I've been on the receiving end of this, of having sat down with people who want to do business with me, who want to, you know, <laughs> get in front of the, the audience. The uh, the people who will sit there with the phone on the table when it vibrates having a conversation, they'll look at it to check their email, see what's coming in. It makes me feel bad as the person that's being sold to, which is a new experience for me. Clearly, I'm generally the person who's doing the selling. But when it's flipped on its head, it makes me feel like they don't care about my time and they're not valuing my time and they're, they're just there to pitch me. Uh, clearly, that's not the way to go about it. So I think there's real value in, you know, phone away, of course, no headphones, no earphones in, but just being really present and, and, and being there for the prospect and just having a good conversation with them. And with that, Susan, I want to get real practical with this because I'm conscious of time here. How do we, when we go, hey, from, from that moment of, because being bold, and faking it till you make it with confidence, perhaps. 
and there's other ways you can go about it can get you to that point of going hello how do we go from hello to um building rapport and building warmth and perhaps finding commonalities is there is there a structure is there a real practical way of doing that um because i think this that's i, I find personally once i'm in the conversation once i've once i've gone oh you know i, I was in chicago uh, a month ago then the conversation just flows but find that initial traction is is the diff not not that it's difficult but is is the point that causes me if i'm going to have any any anxiety about approaching someone it's that moment that um i have to think about so is there a process to achieve that yes first of all i am going to take away everyone's anxiety i have been doing my how to work a room face-to-face presentations for years i have people get up and then we deep brief after they spent five minutes meeting new people and here is the number one thing people have said thousands of people have said when i have said how did it feel to be approached by someone it feels wonderful it feels welcoming it feels like you noticed me you paid attention to me so when you go over to someone especially standing alone it's not only a great strategy it's actually a kind thing to do because they're probably more uncomfortable than you don't be dismissive of them because they're not surrounded by fans they just might be the person that is shy or an introvert that takes a moment to get into the room so that's number one people will tell you it makes them feel good you've paid attention to them that's number one but we, we all have to do before we go in a room do our due diligence go online look at the website go to google go to the go to their facebook page go to linkedin you shouldn't walk into anywhere cold second thing is read the paper go online get whatever you need so that there's a lull on the conversation oh, there's always the latest movie you could talk about or book or a uh, road race or or who knows you know food if the place oh my gosh if the place you're going has food talk about food that's what grandmothers worldwide <laughs> do that's why they make a lot of it and then they make you eat a second helping so you can talk about it my tip when people ask me about going to an event that's like a a stand up event start at the dessert table because the funnest people are eating chocolate and eclairs and bonbons and you can always start a conversation about food is it good how many calories do you think is in it food is a great motivator but if you also prepare your own self introduction so everywhere you go before you go there this is from how to work a room think about how am i going to introduce myself so that the other people in the room will know a little bit about me and the self introduction is not an elevator pitch sales people <laughs> a self introduction is not an up chucking of your elevator pitch it's 7 to 9 seconds it's keyed to the event and then according to my friend Patricia Fripp executive speech coach you give the benefit of what you do rather than your title so the benefit will give the other person a chance to ask a question oh i'm susan rowan i turn people into mingling mavens really what's a mingling maven i said well that's an expert at socializing for business and i wrote how to work a room which is why i can say that and then i stop and i turn to the person i'm with and say these magic words and what about you cuz i could go on for hours <laughs> i wrote 2000 pages but when i say and what about you i don't say what do you do because people may dislike what they do but they love what they volunteer at. Oh, I volunteer at suicide prevention. Oh, I volunteer at a senior home. Oh, I three times a week go and feed the homeless. They may love what they do that's not their job. So when you say and how about you, people can talk about whatever they like and whatever is their passion. Let me just go over that again because I think there's a a very literal step by step process here which i love my analytical brain is firing off here because it takes by having that little pitch uh, i know you said i know you went against calling it a pitch but but you're pitching yourself as opposed to your product or service perhaps you're pitching the the opportunity for a conversation 
by doing that, you're taking away all the emotional side of things and all the baggage. And so you can just jump straight in there. And is is the goal of that first nine seconds then to, and again, this is the wrong word to describe it, but it's the only way I can think of it. Is that to bait them, the other person to say, oh, tell me more. Is that the response that you're looking for with that initial t- uh, you know, 10 second um, start to the conversation? I'm going to take issue with the word you just said. You said bait them. Now that's a pejorative, you know, I I don't know why I'm seeing a fishing reel and like we're (laughs) going to throw it in the water and get back a dead fish. You're not baiting people. What you're doing is giving them something. Let me, let me rephrase it. Are you trying to intrigue them? Is that a better word? That you're trying to intrigue them, but you're also trying to make them feel welcomed and open, show interest in them. You know, are there a lot of people running around going, oh, the best way to be a salesperson and to network is to uh, help people, bef- you know, for don't be so uh, list oriented that way. What you're trying to do is welcome people. You're trying to do is make them feel comfortable while you make yourself comfortable and you give them something to talk about. But as soon as they say what they do, then you're in a conversation. Yeah. You can ask a question. You can share a story. Um, what brought you here? Oh, is this the first time you've been at this uh, venue? Uh, oh, did you find a parking space? It took me like 30 minutes to... Now, all of our salespeople are going, oh, really, that's not to the point. I have something to sell. Well, guess what? This is what I wrote in How to Work a Room. In any room, in any, in any country where people are gathered, no one showed up to buy your product. They showed up to meet other people, to see how they can collaborate, connect, communicate. No one showed up to sign on your bottom line. But if you start with the connecting, which is have your own self-introduction, invite them in by how about you, listen to what they say, come up with a story. Don't be afraid to share a personal story. And then here's another Rowan-ism that I say in my talks, and that is, Bring who you are to what you do. People connect with who you are. Uh, Before the show started, Will and I had a chat. Um, I'm from Chicago. He'd been to Chicago. We had a whole conversation about that for a family wedding. Um, I let him know that one of my secrets is I really want to go to Ireland. I've never been to (laughs) Ireland. It's on my bucket list because I was told I have an Irish sense of humor. So, by the way, if anyone's listening from Ireland, you can pay me to come over there and do a presentation. I would love it. See how I threw a plug in there in the midst of a So let me let me ask you this, because we're running out of time here. And I want to I want to wrap up the show with just this one last question, Suzanne. And that is how or when do we, if at all, transition from we've built with Paul, we've got, you know, we're having a nice conversation with someone we just met. Perhaps we've been talking five minutes or so, going back and forth. We've we've done a small talk. We've done anecdotes. They know what you do and uh, you know what they do. And there's a potential fit for, for a business conversation. Should we have a business conversation there and then? Or is it better to uh, like eject from the conversation but get the details to follow up and leave the conversa- and leave that conversation as this uh, no non-business, just a rapport building um, exercise at that point? Or should we be at some point working into the fact that, you know, they're a good fit for our product, we're, we feel we can add value to them? Um, should, that, should that even come up at all in that first instance? Now, I know a couple of people that will never do that the first two times they talk to people. They just want to build the relationship. But you know your own business, your own product. So I want the people who are listening to know it's a case-by-case basis. You can kind of judge from the situation. But one of the ways you can, shall we say, um, herald that there is a little change is when you are talking to the person, they've told you about what they do, this is where being a storyteller is so great. You can then say, oh, that reminds me of when I worked with so-and-so and blah, 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 and put in a story that relates to what they're doing and how you can help solve the problem, that reminds me of, oh, by the way, have you ever heard of them? Make a conversational. And then you can see how that person responds. And and, and I think it's fair to say after you've had a pleasant conversation and you can see there's a connection, 
This has been great. I think there's some things we could do together. Would love to follow up with you. May I have a card? Be sure to get a card. If they don't ask you for years, nothing is worse than, oh, here's my card. May I offer you one of mine? Because then you never know. They might keep your card and went, oh, my God, it, the light bulb went on the following week that they need to call you. But follow up. When you think that there is something, the magic is in the follow-up. So within three days, send an email. Send an invitation to LinkedIn. Don't use LinkedIn's uh, boilerplate, which, by the way, is so hard to make up your own now. But remind them where they met you. Put in something about the conversation. Uh, and then at some point, this is so old school. Here's how you'll stand out from every other salesperson, sales manager, sales executive. And by the way, the top executives still pick up the phone. And that is pick up the phone. Pick up the phone because when people hear your voice after they've talked to you, they can make that auditory connection. And even if you only leave a voicemail, they can hear the enthusiasm, the regard, the it'll go back to their auditory memory. So the, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. I think you could add it in as you segue, but it's really going to be in the follow-up. Because if someone's got a drink in one hand and there's music and they've got a <laughs> dirt in the other, they're not signing on your bottom line. They're looking the barbecue sauce off their fingers to even hand a card to you. Sure. So I don't know if that answers your it question. Does. But you, I, you answered it really well. In, and I'm not really thought about it from this perspective before of, if someone meant, you know, if you if, if naturally it comes up that you're a good fit, you can add value, your uh, idea of having a story or an anecdote to tell, perhaps you could tell an anecdote of how you've helped someone else in their position. And then yeah. again, you're intriguing them to ask you as opposed to you being pitching them, which is, you know, it can be a bit awkward and a bit weird. And if you're trying to direct the conversation too uh, forcefully like that, then you become the stereotypical salesperson that we're all trying to get away from and, and we're all trying to form more effective strategies than that as well. And with that, Susan, I'm I'm conscious of time here. So I'm going to ask you a question that I asked you last time you came on the show, um, but it's something I ask everyone that comes on, so I'm going to face you with it again. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give her to help her become better at sales? Well, the, the number one thing I would say is they're only people. They're, they're not <laughs> werewolves. They're not, you know, alligators. They're not going to bite you and kill you. And that is, what's the worst thing could happen? Well, it never does. And I would just say, go into every situation as if you believe in your product or your service. Um, that's the most important thing. But I would say, don't sell. I would say what you do is go in and share information about through conversation. And for my younger self, what I would have said is life is a great ride. Enjoy it. There were times I was so nervous. I worked seven days a week, not as a teacher. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I did work hard as a teacher. But as I was starting my business, and I, I, I laid a lot of groundwork. And one is don't be afraid of the hard work. But the other part is don't forget that to build the life and relationships that will help you in your sales career. Take time out to have a cup of coffee or a beer with a colleague, a client, a friend, a cousin, a neighbor, because you never know. <laughs> I appreciate that because I am super guilty of doing what you just described of last year or the past, you know, the past last six months ago, I was building up to the point where we are now of our audience. We just launched the sales school and everything's doing really well. And it's starting to, uh, the revenue levels that are coming in now are nearing to where I was in medical device sales before I left that. And, you know, it's been, um, I'd saved up a, a chunk of change uh, in those day in the medical device days to support me while we got back to this kind of point with the business. But looking back over the six, past six months, it was actually a really nice kind of quiet patch of you know, building relationships, doing interviews, learning loads myself, uh, providing loads of value for the audience and get all this feedback. And it's only ever going to get from this point onwards more and more crazy and hectic. But in the moment six months ago, which is what I'm doing now still, I'm still wrapped up in the moment of I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And it's only when you take that step back that you realize that 
you know, you are on this longer journey and it's very, you know, unless something horrible has happened to you right now in the moment, it's worth just taking that step back and, and appreciating it because, you know, it, it's only going to, if you're being successful in business, very likely it's only going to get more and more stressful until you get to the point where you can hire people and all that kind of stuff, which takes a bit of the load off perhaps. Or adds more aggravation. You never know. <laughs> But I'm glad that this is going well for you. And you've been in a very tough sales area because medical sales is often a very long-term uh, sell. And you have so much to share. And my expertise is really on how do you meet, connect, build. And if it weren't for those skills, I would never have met you, Will. And you know what, Todd, I would say to the people, if you don't have people in your life that you can pick up the phone and call when things are not good, then you haven't lived your life right. That's a nice way of looking at it. And with that, Suzanne, tell us a little bit about the book and then tell us a little bit about the speaking that you do as well, just to wrap up the show. Well, How to Work a Room is available as an ebook anywhere globally. You can also listen to me. And by the way, if you buy the book through Audible and you hear me, you'll go, oh my God, that, that sounds just like her because it <laughs> is me. Three days in a dungeon in San Francisco recording. But we did the whole book, so you will hear that. Um, and I have several other books that are really great that you can go to my website and see, which is susanroane.com, R-O-A-N-E.com. Um, but the speaking is what I love the most. I mean, I just came from speaking to Technology and Manufacturing Association of Illinois. I've spoken to groups worldwide. That is what I love. I love speaking at universities. I just spoke at University of California. I've spoken at um, Yale. I've spoken at different local universities. To me, sharing this message, I'm a former teacher. So whatever I can do to help that audience, help that student get what they need to make their life better. I don't want anyone standing outside of a room afraid to go in. I'd rather and I've done this through my books and speaking and being on shows like yours, I'd rather help you walk in that room, have a great time, meet people, walk out and feel that was a good use of my time. And you can also reach me if you want to hire me to speak by Susan at SusanRoan.com. Notice I said hire, not pro bono. But you can also do this anywhere in the world, 415 415- Four six one three nine one five. Call me, and if you really listen to this and have a burning issue, call me, and we'll brainstorm some solutions. Remember, I was a teacher, still am. Amazing stuff. I appreciate that. And Susan, with that, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your energy, and I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. My pleasure. Loved it. Thank you so much, Will.